Okay. And uh, today we're turning our attention to Aristotle and the politics. We haven't quite left the Republic behind uh, because many of you will have a vexed afternoon answering the reading response question for this week, which is essentially about Aristotle's take on uh, the Socratic project that we found in the Republic. So we haven't quite left uh, the Republic behind. But nonetheless, today what we're going to do is turn our attention to uh, the politics. And we're going to consider Book 1 today. This is the primary focus today will be on Book 1, since you'll be working on Book 2 yourselves. You can go to the side of the room if you want. <laughs> trying to balance things out. Um, so we're going to look at Book 1 today, and then as we go forward, we're going to look at Book 3 uh, tomorrow, uh, and then uh, next week we're going to finish up with uh, the remaining part of Book 3, 3 to 6 tomorrow, we'll start with that, and then the following week we'll pick up with the remaining part of the text. Thereafter, we'll be turning to Cicero, so those of you who have not yet purchased Cicero, I encourage you to do so. Uh, the Polycratic is simply not available, so we'll make that text available to you. Uh, in some kind of an electronic format that you can download. Okay, computers off the desks, what is it? People can understand about computers off the desks. That one doesn't matter. It goes the old-fashioned old way. Crayons or... Uh... Yes? Doesn't matter. If you need to follow the text, you should have printed it out. There are no computer systems. That... What is the only person who's allowed a computer in this room is? And that's because? Right. So, if you wish to blind yourself, like Oedipus Rex, then you may use a computer. Other than that, I apologize, but this is simply the rule of the class, no exceptions. Is it fair that there should be one rule for one person, another rule for everyone else? What does Socrates tell us? What happens if we don't obey the rule of law? This classroom cannot function. I see resistance. You still have not removed the computer from your desk. This is going to happen one way or the other. It goes off the desk. Would you like someone to lend you a piece of paper so you can take notes the old-fashioned way? Is there any ambiguity about my computer rule? Are we all clear? <coughs> this is a tyranny, right? We've been studying different forms of government. This is a tyranny. The tyrant imposes his will. The people resist. Unfortunately, you can't organize a rebellion until after your razor ring. But at that point, come up to my office and like pee on the wall. I mean, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> until then, you simply have to accept the terms of the tyranny. Are we agreed? Yes? Okay, thank you. Okay, today we're turning to Aristotle. Aristotle, I think we can justly say, is certainly the greatest philosopher up until the modern time, certainly the most famous, uh, and we might even say even today still holds that title of being the sort of father of uh, philosophy, of modern, of, of modern philosophical thinking, of the Socratic philosophers. It's hard to understate the importance that Aristotle has played to the development of the intellectual tradition in the West. Aristotle is a foundational, fundamental figure of Western intellectual thought. We might, in fact, note that in the uh, so-called rediscovery of Aristotle, for many, many centuries, Aristotle's works were lost. And in the 12th and 13th century in Europe, there was the rediscovery of his corpus from a very small number of works that had been known to the translation from the ancient Greek and, and sometimes Arabic into Latin of the vast majority of his corpus that, that took place in the 12th century and gave rise to what Charles Homer Haskins, the great Harvard historian, has called the Renaissance of the 12th century. Uh, stands sort of at the beginning then of this intellectual uh, movement that takes place in the West that culminates then ultimately with the kind of intellectual developments that we know further on. Thomas Aquinas, the great figure of, of Christian theology of the high Middle Ages, uh, spent his entire life, essentially, to reconcile his Christian cosmology with the thought of Aristotle, to the point where he simply referred to Aristotle as the philosopher. So in his words, when you see, Ar when you see the philosopher, that means Aristotle. But not only in the West. For example, in the Jewish tradition, Moses Maimonides, the great Jewish uh, thinker and philosopher of the medieval period, said of Aristotle that he was the master of all who are wise, Aristotle as the teacher. So Aristotle, in this sort of Western sense, has this very dominant role. We take, actually, we might even note that, for example, Francis Bacon, the, um, the author of what we think of as the 
modern scientific method, wrote a book in the 16th, 17th century called The New Organon, the Novum Organon, in which he essentially tried to, as he saw it, rescue inquiry from what had become its Aristotelian canonization. The people were too wedded to the principles of Aristotle, and so <coughs> the Novum Organon Bacon tries to lay out a new way of thinking about things. That alone demonstrates the degree to which Western thinking had become Aristotelian by nature. So we look at Aristotle and we turn to this figure we're looking at, uh, in this case, a small work, but that's part of a much larger corpus of one of the great thinkers of the Western uh, tradition. So let's talk a little bit about who this guy was, his life, what he did, uh, his general approach, and then we'll turn our attention more specifically to uh, the first part of the politics. He was born in 384 BC, before Common Era, in a part of Greece known then and now as Macedonia, in a town called Stagyrus, and that's why you'll sometimes see Aristotle referred to as the Stagyrite. Um, and at a young age, much like you, he went off to university, said, unlike you, the university he went to had, does anyone know who his teacher was? Plato. Plato. His teacher was Plato. You have, you're stuck with me. Right? By the way, Plato was also not allowed computers in his class, that's for sure. Uh, so he went off to Plato's academy, uh, and he studied there as a student at Plato's academy, and like as happens to some very sort of keen students, he never left. He stayed there not just for four years, but for decades. He stayed there for, in fact, 20 years, and a lot of what we have from his pen uh, dates to that period when he was working and studying at Plato's academy. He left in 347, which was the year that Plato died, and he went for a couple of years to live in a small town in what is now Turkey, the town of Assos. And then he went from there to the Isle of Lesbos, which is nearby. Uh, he spent a couple of years there, until he was summoned by essentially his patron, or a patron, the famous Philip of Macedonia, who was the king of that region of uh, Greece, to tutor his son. Philip needed to have a good teacher for his son. He had high hopes and ambitions for this young man. So he asked Aristotle to come and to tutor his son in the ways of knowledge. Does anyone know who his son was? Alexander the First. Not the first. The Great. The Great. Yes, yeah. Alexander the Great. Um, so it's actually a very sort of fanciful notion of the great Aristotle teaching Alexander the Great, sort of, uh, sort of uh, immersing him in these sort of high levels of, uh, of knowledge. The reality is probably that he only taught Alexander the Great for a year <coughs> at most, because Alexander, as a young uh, member of the royal Macedonian household, had other important things to do, like conquer much of the known world. So uh, the degree to which Aristotle left an indelible imprint on Alexander the Great is not entirely clear. In any event, uh, after a number of years working within the court of uh, Philip of Macedonia, he returned to Athens in 335, and he set up an institution the name of which is still carried forth to this day, associated with education. Those of you who have been through one form or another of lycée education will know that the origins of that word are from the Aristotelian Lyceum, the school that Aristotle set up in Athens in 335. And he worked there for about a decade until in 323 he left Athens for the city of Chalcis, of, um, Chalcis sorry, uh, and he died the following year. His departure from Athens in 323 accompanied by, it's speculated, uh, the rise of anti-Macedonian sentiment in the city of Athens linked to the career of Alexander the Great. And Aristotle is famously said to have uh, uh, remarked that he would flee Athens because he did not want Athens to sin against philosophy for a second time. Who was the first person that we find at the beginning of the Athenian sin? Not Plato, but Socrates, Socrates right? So, so Aristotle was not a Socratic figure. He wasn't willing to, to drink hemlock for the cause. Uh, he wanted to go off and uh, he, he, was, he was happier to retire uh, to an island. And he died very shortly thereafter. So that in very broad strokes is the life of, of Aristotle. Within that period, he spent most of his time engaged in what is to our eyes today a just dizzying array of inquiry. We tend to think of Aristotle as a philosopher, and we tend to use the modern sense of philosophy in, sort of, in thinking about him in that way, in, in, in the way that we attach him to that label. But we should think about him in the way that philosophy, in, or should think about him in the purest sense of philosophy, a lover of knowledge. That's truly who Aristotle was. Because if there was some area in which knowledge could be exercised, there you would find Aristotle inquiring into it. 
So for example, a full one quarter of the uh, corpus of his works that we still have today are not related to ethics or politics or metaphysics. They're related to zoology and anatomy and biology. He was fascinated, for example, with the way in which organisms work. He dissected creatures. He was very interested uh, in the natural world. And so we find that Aristotle, over the course of his life, turns his attention to a, an enormous array of subjects. Today, we would call them the disciplines of things like mathematics, of biology, of zoology, of physics, of astronomy, not to mention theater and dance and comedy and rhetoric, as well as ethics, politics, philosophy, metaphysics, and so on. A truly extraordinary range uh, of intellectual inquiry uh, that uh, Aristotle undertook. We, most of his works have disappeared, sadly. We have only about, it's estimated, somewhere between one quarter to one third of the total amount that he wrote. Uh, but what we do have is extraordinary enough. It has produced entire industries of scholars who spend their careers dissecting and trying to figure out Aristotle. Now that you have read a bit of the politics, you can appreciate that Aristotle is not always the clearest uh, author to read. There are often ideas in Aristotle that seem oblique and difficult to penetrate, which is curious because Cicero, to whom we shall turn our attention next, and was a great stylist of both Latin and Greek prose, Cicero described Aristotle's writing as a river flowing of gold. Now that you've read the politics, would you describe the language of the politics as a river flowing of gold? Probably not. If anything, it's a muddy river silted up with bits of stuff in it, difficult to get around, probably not a river you want to spend that much time in, uh, in terms of its prose style. How can we reconcile the Ciceronian judgment, Aristotle, a writer of golden prose, compared to the stuff that we have in front of us? And the answer is probably because what remains of many of Aristotle's work, and that's certainly the case of the politics, is not a finished work intended for publication. This was not... Uh, a work that Aristotle had sort of crafted in a very fine way in order to then uh, distribute to a wide audience. These were probably his lecture notes. These were probably the, the stuff he scribbled down so that when he was teaching his students, he'd remember more or less where he was. Which is why we find extraordinarily important concepts, such as the one we'll be discussing today, the zoon politicon, man is a political animal, extremely pregnant idea, dispatched in about two pages. You think, to be able to fully understand the depth and complexity of that concept, it would be worth an entire chapter. And yet, he deals with it in only two pages. I think the reason for that is because if you were actually in Aristotle's classroom, he knew all the stuff he wanted to say, so he just had to put down basically a few notes, and then he would carry on uh, at great length. <coughs> so when we look at the politics of Aristotle, and indeed much of his work, we're often seeing the sort of internal mechanics of his thinking as opposed to these uh, finished, polished works that he, uh, that he wrote. We know that he had what he called popular works because he makes reference to one of them in, in his <coughs> politics. If you turn to 1278b, uh, 30, you'll see he says, uh, he talks about the existence of popular works. It's on page 70 for those of you who have the text. Uh, you can see that he says, there is no difficulty in distinguishing the various kinds of rule. They have been often defined already in our popular discussions find already in our popular discussions, that is, the discussions that were intended for the public. So it suggests that there's this distinction between Aristotle's public works and these uh, writings that we have uh, for us today. Before we turn specifically to the kinds of issues that we find in Book 1 of The Politics, I think we need to quickly review uh, some of the key elements of Aristotelian thinking. It's a bit unfair to ask you jump into a complex work like the politics without any sort of context for how Aristotle understood the world, how he understood the nature of inquiry, uh, the nature of his hermeneutics, the nature of his epistemology, and so on. So we'll make a few brief comments about how Aristotle understood the nature of inquiry, because it matters then to how we will interpret and understand uh, the politics. The first thing we can say is, and this I should note, my own view, so we might have a different reading. But I think we might, in very sort of broad strokes, characterize a fundamental transformation that takes place between teacher and student. Students are often seeking to sort of position themselves with respect to their teacher by taking contrary positions, and I think that's the case here. Plato, as we saw, is fundamentally concerned with this world of forms. There is this 
ideal abstract world which represents the perfection of things, and so a lot of the inquiry we find in Platonic texts is directed towards that end. Aristotle, by contrast, is unambiguously an empiricist. He is somebody who is really interested in uh, the, the sort of the starting premise of observation. What can I see? What can I observe? You may remember that in Plato, we saw, for example, we didn't read it ourselves, but we discussed it in class, the parable of the cave. The very idea in that parable of the cave is we should not trust what we see. We are not seeing what is true. And so therefore the senses, the idea of perception, the world of perception, is not a true world. We have to go beyond that. Aristotle, by contrast, starts with the idea that perception, the phenomena, the things that you can see and observe, matter. And they can be used then as the starting point, as the basis for an inquiry in which to fundamentally reveal the truth about things. So that represents a fundamental shift, a fundamental transformation, if you will, of intellectual perspective from a Platonic to an Aristotelian uh, framework. He himself called it phenomena, the idea of phenomena, that you start with what you can see. And he also had this idea that once you've taken what you can see, uh, you appeal to what he called endoxa. Hence, endoxic method. Endoxa, which is credible opinion, the opinions <coughs> that seem to be reasonable. And what the idea was that based on what you could see, you then made reference to credible opinion and you interrogated that opinion uh, in order to inquire as to its truth or its, uh, or its, uh, its truth or whether it was false. In order to do that, you needed to have a system of logic. You needed to have a way to proceed from one point to the next logically in order to interrogate what that credible opinion was. And we find then that Aristotle spends a lot of, or has, uh, dedicates a number of his works to the question of logic. Indeed, Aristotelian logic remains a fundamental part of modern philosophy. And that idea of logic for Aristotle was fundamental because what gives you certainty or what gives you confidence about moving from the phenomena that you observe to the truths that you conclude relates to the kind of logical process that you bring that connects those two together. So that the robustness or the vigor of your logic connects then to the confidence you may have about the truth uh, that you inquire. Uncharacteristically for Aristotle, who is usually quite modest about his works, in his work on logic he says, of all the things that I've done, I hope that you, having read this, will see that there is not inconsiderable value uh, in this system of logic. And you can see in the politics, the way that he works through his ideas follows this kind of very logical sequence. We talk about this, and we talk about this, and we talk about this, and you constantly test your suppositions and your propositions. So that sense of an Aristotelian logic that's worked out as a way of uh, substantiating the use of phenomena, the use of phenomena, the use of what you can observe in order to discover the truth of things. One of the things that we find in Aristotle and it's important then to our discussion of the politics, is what's being referred to as his essentialism, Aristotelian essentialism. What is the essence of something, right? Which is what Aristotle asks, uh, and believes lies often in the truth of fundamental things. For example, the essence of man might be our capacity to reason. That is what makes us what we are. So this sense that you can, through the observation of phenomena, ultimately arrive at an understanding of the essence of something uh, is essentially drives forward Aristotelian inquiry. And we find in a lot of Aristotle's works uh, an, an effort, painstaking, to separate what is the essence of something and what is merely, as he calls it, a property of something. That which an item or an object might have, but does not in fact make it what it is. For example, it may be that human capacity to reason is our essence, but the fact that we have eyes and ears is not an essence of humanity, because many things have eyes and ears. It is merely a property of man. So that distinction between what is essence and what is property, we find is a fundamental distinction in the Aristotelian uh, logical scheme. Finally, I will note one other aspect of the Aristotelian intellectual framework which uh, helps, uh, helps us understand what is the fundamental truth of things because it also pertains to uh, what we find in the politics, which was Aristotle's belief that if you could answer four basic questions, you would be able to arrive at 
the truth of something, at the truth of the matter, his so-called four causes idea. The four causes are the material, the formal, the efficient, and the final. The material cause refers to what something is made of. The formal cause describes why it takes the form or shape that it does. The efficient cause explains why it comes into being or what makes it move. And the final cause is why it is there. What is its purpose? What is it there for? And I will give you some examples specifically of this because in the context of the state, Aristotle subjects the state to this causal analysis. He provides both a material, or I should say he provides a material, formal, efficient uh, cause of the state. And I will describe that. We'll talk about that in specific terms in just a moment. Aristotle believed that if you could determine with confidence and accuracy the material, formal, efficient, and final cause of something, you would know what it was. You would then be able to act uh, to access the truth of something. Yeah? Sorry, can you just repeat what the efficient and final are? The efficient is what brings about something or what makes it move. And the final cause is what it is there for. What's the purpose? And the material? The material is what it's made of, and the formal describes why it is the way it is. Why does it take a certain shape? What is its form? This will become clearer when we turn our attention to the city-state. We'll see some specific examples of how uh, we see those causes uh, in action. But the point being was that if you could, with any kind of confidence, determine what these four causes were, then you would have some clear notion of what, uh, of what the object was that you were looking at. And that would give you then a sense of its truth in the purest sense of the word. And so when we look at the, uh, the politics, what we'll find is under sort of using that kind of causal structure, really a lot of the politics is about trying to distinguish, trying to determine the nature of each of these, of each of these causes. So with that sort of general background, and I have to see, you'll have to admit, you'll have to, I'm uh, sorry, um, uh, grant me the leave to be extremely glib in my description of Aristotle. Aristotelian thought in 20 minutes, that ain't easy. Uh, but with that very basic sort of description in place, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn our attention today uh, to book one. It's an extraordinary uh, book in which, on the one hand, it seems that Aristotle lays out a very fundamental condition for how he's going to inquire about the nature of politics and the nature of the state. And then very shortly thereafter, he <coughs> seems to go into a lengthy and disturbing defense of an institution that I think all of us would find deplorable, slavery. Uh, and then, particularly in our uh, modern age, proceeds to describe the conditions of the family in ways that are probably somewhat deplorable as well, in terms of how he sees equality between the sexes and the like. Um, so I'd like to spend uh, the remaining time that we have together to consider the sort of two or three fundamental ideas that are contained in this first book and to see if we can understand why it is uh, that Aristotle engages in this, in this kind of exercise. Let's first start, we'll start with Aristotle's own words at the very beginning of book one. He says, every state is a community of some kind, and every community is established with a view to some good. For everyone always acts in order to obtain that which they think good. Nice statement of the economic principle of utility maximization right there. But if all communities aim at some good, the state, or the political community, which is the highest of all, and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good. This is the way in which Aristotle starts the politics, that the state is built through, or seeking to achieve the highest good. What is the highest good? What does he mean by the sense that all, we all seek to achieve that which is good, the state seeks to achieve the highest good? What does he mean by that? What is the highest good? 
I think here we need to pause to understand, to, to sort of take a moment to reflect on what he intends to say by that. There is a concept in the ethics, and we've already seen it a little bit with Plato. Eudaimonia. Has anyone heard of this word before? Eudaimonia. Yes. Yes, sort of. The problem with eudaimonia is very hard to define. I was reading an article yesterday by the Harvard philosopher Thomas Nagel, 40 pages long, to try to figure out what this term meant. Uh, we can start with deconstructing the term. Eo means good. And daimon means spirit. It's not much of a pen, is it? So it's good spirit at its very sort of etymological level. Good spirit. But we usually define it as happiness or uh, but often you'll find that scholars choose to translate it as flourishing. Florissant in French, or floreciente in Spanish, or gedeien in German. Flourishing, the idea of flourishing, flourish. So eudaimonia is often described as this idea of <coughs> Flourishing of yourself, flourishing of man. What does that mean, happiness flourishing? We've already seen this concept. Remember that in the Republic, how is it that Socrates defines justice? That which makes you happy now, that which makes you happy later. Right? So the concept of eudaimonia, eudaimonia, we can see already has some hints in Plato. Not surprising, Aristotle having spent so many uh, years at the Platonic Academy that he would pick up on some of these ideas uh, that we find in Platonic thought. Uh, in the context of Aristotle, the sense is that this is what we are striving to achieve, that we all want to have this state of happiness, the state of human flourishing, uh, eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, sorry. But the question is, what is happiness? What is flourishing? For example, if I give you a lot of money, aren't you happy? I give you a lot of money and a very nice car, aren't you happy? And a big house, and say, you don't have to work, even better, right? Does that make you happy if you have a lot of material comfort? Is that eudaimonia? Really? It's just a, sound, it's just eu. <laughs> yes. So where's the daimonia part? Yeah. Part of it, you're quite right, part of it is using our reason, right? One of the things that we say, remember, this idea of essentialism, what is it that makes us what we are, our sense of reason. So that's part of it. But there's another part of it as well. We are capable of reasoning, and we're also capable of something else that we've also seen from Plato. This idea of excellence or virtue. Remember, we noted that one of the things that Plato's keen to, or Socrates is keen to encourage, is this reading of justice as an excellence that is within the soul, this idea that we all have, we saw the word already, ariti, virtue or excellence. And so, at a very basic level, eudaimonia, the good life, human happiness, human flourishing, is this combination of our capacity for excellence, moral virtue, and our own ability to reason. Moral virtue guided by wisdom uh, seems to be uh, the easiest way that we can understand uh, the nature of a eudaimonia. That is the greatest good, human excellence or excellence guided by virtue. I have a quote here from that paper by Thomas Nagel. He says, eudaimonia involves not just the activity of the theoretical intellect, but the full range of human life and action in accordance with the broader excellences of moral virtue and practical wisdom. The full range of human life and action in accordance with moral virtue and practical wisdom. So that is this idea of eudaimonia. It is not a single thing, it is a composite of things. It is an array. It is, we might say, a state of being, a way of thinking, a way of acting, all coming 
uh, together. And in the Nicomachean Ethics and the uh, Eudomian Ethics, we find Aristotle spends a great deal of time working through what this notion is of eudaimonia. So at the very beginning of the book, when he says that the state or political community, which is the highest of all and embraces all other communities, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good, what he's essentially stating is that the purpose of the state is this notion of eudaimonia, of human happiness, of human flourishing. That is the purpose of the state. And so in a way, it allows us then, from the very first lines, to understand what is the core motivation behind this book. Why did Aristotle want to undertake the project of the politics? If we go back to our four causes, it is not the material, nor the formal, nor the efficient, but the final cause that occupies Aristotle primarily in this book. What is the state for? What is its purpose? That is ultimately uh, the intellectual project that is being undertaken in the politics. We might note a couple of points about the way in which he constructs, then, this book, the way in which it is distinguished, indeed, from its predecessor, the Republic, to whom or to which it is nonetheless somewhat indebted. The first thing that we'll note, perhaps the most important thing that we'll note, is that it's shorter, and students around the world are grateful for that, right? We'll also note, though, that unlike the Republic, which had very little concern, as we saw, for realism. It wasn't, uh, Socrates was not interested particularly in, uh, in trying to ground the Republic in practical examples. Occasionally, we saw when we reviewed the Republic, he asked, I wonder if this is feasible, could this happen, and so on. By contrast, Aristotle's work is very grounded in the empirical, is very grounded in the practical. He is over and over and over again using precise, specific examples to illustrate what he's talking about. I'll give you a few, uh, a few examples uh, by way to illustrate the point. For example, on the problem of subordinating your neighbors on page 49 of the text of 1269a, he uses the example of Sparta and Crete and notices that these, or observes that these two city-states, Sparta and Crete, have very different ways of dealing with their neighbors. The Cretans seem to get along quite well with their neighbors, whereas the Spartans are constantly dealing with armed rebellion. On the question of whether the state should be ordered to give men despotic powers over their neighbors. Again, another important point uh, for ancient Greek politics. At 1324b, he gives us the example of Sparta, Crete, Carthage, and Scythia. And he draws specific attention to how those states order their, uh, order their affairs with their neighbors. When he asks the question how magistrates should be chosen, he uses the example of the small city-state of Megara a town in Greece at 1300a. When he asks uh, how cities should define, or he, when he argues that cities are more than just entities that exist for the purposes of mutual protection and mutual security or mutual trade benefit, he points to the example of Carthage and its trading allies to demonstrate that a city should not be seen just in those ways. So when we go through the text of Aristotle, one of the things we have that we don't have in Plato is a constant reference to the world as it is, not the world as it might be. This is not a utopian text, as we saw in Plato. Yeah? He describes many times also the human nature to argue with poems. He does, although Plato also makes reference to human nature. But maybe we might argue that Aristotle's reference to human nature is more more realistic. realistic. Yes. I mean, that's something to do maybe that he was such a, uh, he has such a, an idea of, about zoological. Uh, it could be. I think what we see when we look at those examples, when we, under, when we look at Aristotle's interest in telling his readers, look at this city state, look at this city state, look at this big place over here, this is Y, X, or Y, or Z, I think what we're seeing is essentially. Uh, the text being grounded in empirical terms. It's an empirically driven text so that we can make specific reference to actual examples. So that is to say that the politics is not concerned with the state as it might be, ideally. The politics is concerned with the state as it is. And Aristotle then wants to give us a description of that state and how we can then understand it and best direct it towards its full, its function, towards its final cause which is the realization of eudaimonia uh, for the citizens who live within. The very first 
The very first thing that Aristotle says in the book, it is perhaps one of the most famous things, if not the most famous thing that Aristotle ever said, is that man is a political animal, a zoon political, right? It's the very first thing that we get. And it is dealt with in a remarkably brief fashion, this remarkable notion. And yet a lot hinges on that observation that man is a zoon political. That we are by our nature uh, political. There's a lot that we can attach to that concept. That concept carries with it a lot of significance. And we might consider what the significance uh, of, of that idea is. But first, I think, is that this means that the art of politics is a practical art. It is in our nature. It is something that we need to develop in order that we may live better lives. So it functions in this practical, in this practical way. It also means that it is important, if it is in our nature, that we understand what the aim of politics is. What is the telos, as the Greeks called it? The purpose. What is the purpose of politics? What is this final cause? What is the telos of man in a political society? What are we trying to achieve? And the third, I think, point that comes out of this observation that man is a political animal is it means that the conclusions, it means that the observations that Aristotle makes and the conclusions that he draws from them leads to a reading of, the, of politics, leads to a reading of the state, not in descriptive terms, but in normative terms. I'll explain what I mean. It is not that we simply observe the world around us and write down what we see. It is that we observe the world around us, write down what we see, and discuss, analyze, consider it, and then try to derive conclusions about what would be the best state, given what we see. Normative is, in other words, prescribing, it's directing us towards a certain kind of solution. There is one state that is better than another. There is one political society that is better than another. There is one way of defining citizenship that is better than another. And so therefore, there is a normative element to the project behind, the Aristotelian, uh, behind this Aristotelian idea that man is a political animal. Because if we are a political animal, it means that we have in our very nature this need to practice politics. And if you can practice something, you can practice it well, or you can practice it poorly. And that means that we need then to undertake an inquiry. Gentlemen, are we okay? You sure? Would you like to move to that side of the room? I'm not making you, I'm just asking. Would you like to, or would you like to stay where you are? Okay. Can we have your attention for, I only need 30 more minutes, and then you're out of here. It's not a long time. That's not even the prologue to a Britney Spears concert. <laughs> I just dated myself horrendously there, did I not? <laughs> arcade Fire, Arcade Fire, we're all about Arcade Fire, right? Good Montreal Band, my hometown. Okay, so we see then this element of normativity. Was that a comment on Arcade Fire? What? No, never mind. Um, we see this normativity underlying then the project of the city coming out of this first fundamental observation, man is a political animal. Let's see what he says about this idea that man is a political animal. It is, of course, famously described to us uh, in 1253a, or 1252 and 1253, and let's review his argument. The first thing he argues is that the, the state is natural. It is not an artificial construction. It is something that is natural, right? He says, it is evident that the state is a creation of nature and that man is by nature a political animal. And he who by nature, not by mere accident, is without a state, is either a bad man or above humanity. It is evident that the state is a creation of nature and that man is a, by nature a political animal. What is his evidence? What is his proof that we are by nature a political animal? Because this, I think, is the key element where he throws off a line and he says, this is enough to show true, and yet in that one line there is an enormous amount of significance that we need to understand. What is it that makes us political by nature? What does he say? No. No. The fact that we have in ourselves the need to... No. I think it's because he compares the state with household. No. Because he said that nature doesn't do anything. No. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Is that what you were going to say? It might be unfair. It was that. But how come you didn't say speech? I, I just cut. I just cut off five people rudely. You knew you had a. It was a. It was a short buzzer there. You could have just said speech. Get it out there. Instead, the glory goes over now to the left side of the room. Oh well. It's okay. Thank you for playing today, right side of the room. Uh, it'd be nice to have you as well. We have consolation prize at the end of the year. Yes, class. Speech. Speech. That's what makes us political animals. We are the only animal that has speech. What is the Greek word for speech? We've seen this before. Those of you who read ancient Greek, my bad handwriting, logos. Logos is the word for speech. Logos also means something else in ancient Greek. What else does it mean? Logos means also word. reason. And so we find, right, in this thing, we are distinguished from bees and other animals because we have this ability of logos, of speech, but also then of reason. This is what makes us political animals. Why does that? I mean, we mentioned all these other things which are true. We live in households, households are like mini states, etc. Everything else that everybody mentioned is true, but it all springs from this fundamental notion, as he says, that we are the only animal who has the gift of logos, the gift of speech. Why does that then make us political by nature? What is it about that that makes us political animals? Okay. Yes, it enables us to start creating categories of things that then refer back to what leads to the good life. As he says, the power of speech is intended to set forth the expedient and the inexpedient, that which should be and that which not should be. Therefore, likewise, the just and the unjust, and it is characteristic of man that he alone has any sense of good and evil. From speech, from logos, from reason, comes then this understanding of what is good and what is bad, what is just and what is unjust, and everything then springs from that one observation. It's worth noting this word logos, that means both speech and reason, is a very, very uh, pregnant term. There's a lot of stuff that's hiding here. What does he mean by this idea of speech or reason? And I might, it's hard to know, many scholars have argued a great deal over this one particular question, but I'm going to suggest to you we might take uh, a proposition that comes from another Aristotelian work, which is on rhetoric. He talks about rhetoric. And he decides, in, in the rhetoric, he provides this example of three modes of persuasion, which will be familiar to those of you who have ever had a fight with your parents because you wanted them to do something and they didn't want to. Uh, the first is what he calls ethos. Ethos, which is when you make reference to yourself and how good you are. Right? Let me go on the trip. I'm a great person. You know me, Mom. I won't do anything bad. I'm a good kid. Right? You can trust me. I'm an excellent person. Ethos. Making reference to your character. The character of the speaker. You should believe me because I'm good. The second one that he describes is pathos. Creating this climate of empathy that you want to get people, put people into certain moods. Mom, if you don't let me go on the trip, I'm going to be so sad. Everybody else is going. All my friends are going. I'll be sitting here all alone. You should really let me go. It's okay. Right? Create that sense of empathy. And the third is, he calls, logos. Speech, the power to persuade. The ability of your words to persuade of your position. So if it turns out making reference to your moral character and making your mom feel sorry for you isn't enough, then you can simply get into the argument about, Mom, you cannot afford not to let me go on this trip. You have to make it and I will tell you why. And that's when you bring your full arsenal of rhetorical and intellectual skills to bear to present an unimpeachable, uh, an unimpeachable idea. Yes, sir? The second one is pathos. The pathos. Ethos, pathos, and logos. The three uh, arts of persuasion in the Aristotelian world of rhetoric. But note the power of logos. Logos doesn't just mean speech in that sense, does it? What does it mean? It means speech that persuades. Speech that is persuasive. Speech that gets you to understand that further is comprehension. So when he talks about this idea, because I think it's important when he says that we alone have logos, animals can communicate, can they not? They make sounds, and they convey certain information by those sounds. Aristotle spent at least a quarter of his life interrogating the biological and zoological world. He knew about that. He knew that the sounds that animals make 
you know, part of this phenomena that he was exploring must have served some purpose. What is the purpose it serves? Maybe to demonstrate distress or hunger or something like that. But the sounds that we make, the speech that we have, the logos that we have, attached to reason, has, has this characteristic of persuasion that we can use our speech in order to set forth certain kinds of positions. And that's then what makes us a political animal. That justice and injustice, that good and bad, that these things spring into being. They are made possible by this gift of logos. And so it is that element that he talks about that gives us this, uh, that makes us then by nature a political animal. But there's something else that attaches to speech as well. It's not just our ability to persuade. If I am speaking, there must be somebody else. It also creates the sense of the, necess the necessity of a relationship, of certain kinds of relationships that characterize who we are. And so when we have the sense of logos, we inevitably then also have the sense of the kind of relationships that logos can create. I can speak to you. I can persuade you. I can love you, I can express myself in these kinds of ways, and this then creates a certain kind of bond, an affinity, an affection, that then can exist between people. And I think that's very fundamental, because the political, the art of politics, the understanding of politics, ultimately comes down to the way in which people live together. And it is logos that creates, that enables, creates, and determines how we then live together. And we'll see that a lot of the politics when we come to our discussion tomorrow and next week, a lot of the politics is determined by us trying to figure out what is the best way in which we can uh, characterize that coming together, that living together. What are the conditions uh, that make that uh, that need that best for our own lives and allow us best to pursue the good life, allow us to flourish. Having laid out this idea that man is by nature a political animal, yes. Yes, I think that's right. The concept of relationship implies reciprocity, right? Mm -hmm. Except there's one relationship which doesn't seem to have a lot of reciprocity, which is what we're about to turn to now, which is slavery. It is, for many students, not just students, for many people, very jarring to find that you're barely three or four pages into this book, and suddenly Aristotle, this great figure, you surrounded your whole life, you know, this wonderful thinker, launches into a vigorous defense of slavery, of enslaving people. It's a very awkward moment for many people. How do we deal with this? And it seems foundational. It's right there in book one. It's like, okay, we're a political animal. Now what do I want to talk to, slaves? Right? How do we make sense of this discussion of slavery? What can we do with that? A number of scholars, not inconsiderable number of scholars, simply say, okay, we've talked about the zoon politicon, man is by nature a political animal. Now let's turn to book two. And they simply skip over that part to say, well, don't really know what to make of it. Other people have argued, well, look, in ancient Greece, slavery was a pervasive institution. Everyone had slaves. It's just the way they did things back then. So we simply say that Aristotle was a product of his time, right? A kind of a zeitgeist argument. Doesn't that undermine them? Not necessarily. We could simply say it's simply that he, you know, you, you cannot, it's not always easy to think outside of the strictures that surround you. But I think there's a problem with that argument, that Aristotle's understanding of slavery is merely a product of, the, of his time, that he's simply taking this as a given because everybody is doing it. Because Aristotle himself is at great pains to talk about slavery in two ways. How does he talk about slavery? Yeah? The way take a slave from a war, someone uh, yes. who was a high uh, warrior in his society, and you take it as a slave for use for yourself. That's not cool. Should he be a slave? That's right. And we can put it more generally. We can use Aristotle's own language. He asks, he tries to understand the difference between slavery as it is natural and slavery as it is conventional. In the example you're talking about, yes, somebody who's not really a slave, who is nonetheless enslaved because of an unjust war, is conventional slavery. But he asks, is there such a thing as natural slavery? So if we say, well, he was simply the product of his time, everyone had slaves, that would be fine if Aristotle simply accepted slavery and then moved on. But he doesn't. He goes more profoundly into the question, is slavery just? 
Is it a right thing? Is it something we find in nature? And he then spends a lot of time trying to interrogate uh, or to reveal the difference between what he calls the conventional and the natural definition of slavery. Well, I think we need to contend with this in Aristotle's thought. I don't think we'll, I don't think it's acceptable that we simply pass over to book two and say, well, it's too bad that he felt this way, so we'll simply move on. Because it's so fundamental, it's clearly foundational to his project. It's the very first thing that he wants to talk to us about when he tries to push forward the notion of what politics means. So whether we'll be able to clarify or not, I don't know. But I think we at least need to give a chance, we need to allow uh, an airing of what he tries to say about this subject so that we can at least understand why it is there and what it means for this text. Let's first ask, what is it that he sees as characterizing the master and the slave? What does the master have in natural terms, not in conventional terms, let's start it, as he sees it as a natural condition? What does the master have that the slave does not? He um, has more power than the slave, which is the slave is naturally born submissive, and the master is naturally born um, better. Or what, is the, what is it that makes the master better? You're right, there is this unevenness. That, that's, that that reflects in the natural condition of the slave. But what is it that the master has that the slave lacks? Logos. Logos, reason, right? The master is capable of full reasoning. And the slave, he says, cannot reason. The slave can apprehend reason. He can understand the reasoning of others. But the slave cannot reason for himself. And so as a result of this discrepancy between those who can reason and those who can only apprehend reason, therefore, Aristotle argues that there is such a thing as natural slavery. That, for us, probably is a very difficult concept for us to get our heads around, that the world is divided into those who are armed with the capacity to reason, and there are those who can simply apprehend it but cannot reason for themselves. Yes, sir? Can we deduce from there that Aristotle thinks that uh, people are not born equally? that they, uh, some are born better than others? I think we can absolutely conclude that, yes. If some are by nature master, and some are by nature slave, there is clearly this idea that there is inequality in terms of your ability to exercise your human reason. He actually goes and says that as much. We might say, uh, if we take a look at, if it's at the end of the, of the book, says, you can see where he talks about this, it's on page 29, well, for those of you who have the uh, printed out version, 1260B, uh, 1260A, sorry, he says, the slave has no deliberative faculty at all, to deliberate, to think through things, to cogitate. The slave has no deliberative faculty at all. And he says, and a little bit further on, he says, the ruler ought to have excellence of character and perfection for his function taken absolutely demands a master artificer. The subjects, on the other hand, require only that measure of excellence which is proper to each of them. And so this idea of a reti, of excellence, of virtue, seems to apply in different measure to those who shall rule and to those who shall be ruled. So there does, there's unambiguously this sense of inequality. Now, it is true that some scholars have argued that in, in this description of slavery, there is a subtle <laughs> argument that Aristotle is making by trying to draw this distinction between natural and conventional slavery, that what he's really trying to do is attack the way in which slavery was practiced during his day, at his, uh, during his at the time that he was alive. Because he notes, you brought it up, there is an argument, he says, although there are these natural, there is this natural condition called slavery, there are some who say that slavery is unjust because of the way in which it has been agreed upon by convention. And he gives the example of those who are enslaved as a result of an unjust war. And that means that people who by their nature are not slaves, who nonetheless find themselves in an enslaved condition. Yes, sir. I'm not sure, but I think later on, when he keeps on talking about masters and slaves, he kind of, he doesn't talk about slaves in the way that we think about slaves right now. He said that masters and slaves are like one entity and they profit from each other. Like if the master is unjust to the 
slave. Not quite. He says the slave belongs to the master's body. Yeah. But the master does not belong to the slave. So it is actually, it's a, it's a, it's a unilateral relationship in that way. There are some obligations on the part of the master. He says the master must learn the art of being a master. There's an excellence of being a master. That's true. But in terms of that kind of what you're talking about, that sort of imperative that's there, that exists on the part of the slave. The slave belongs to the master as though part of his body. But that does not apply the other way around. If we come back though, to this idea, this problem, this attempt that some scholars have made to say in Aristotle, well, there's actually a subtle argument being made here against slavery because of the way in which it was practiced by convention. We might notice then these two points that he raises. One, that there are those who are enslaved against their nature as a result of unjust war. And we might use the phrase, might makes right. Right? Is that actually fair? No. So therefore we find that many who are enslaved should not be enslaved because it is not part of their nature. And he makes another argument. Uh, which is in this sort of incredibly dense text, which I've read many times and I still don't quite understand, but I'll read it together, maybe reading it out loud will help me. 325, uh, 1254, the end of 1254b, the beginning of 1255a, he says, we would like it if nature could arrange such that all the slaves had very big bodies and very small brains, basically, and that all the masters had kind of weak, puny bodies like mine, but gigantic brains, and that way it would be pretty straightforward, okay, Slave master, slave master, slave master, right? We'd be able to distinguish by appearance who should be a slave and who should be a master. He says, nature would like to distinguish between the bodies of free men and slaves, making the one strong for servile labor, the other upright, and although useless for such services, useful for political life in the arts both of war and peace. But the opposite often happens, and some have the souls and others have the bodies of free men, and doubtless, if men differed from one another in the mere forms of their bodies, all would acknowledge that the inferior class should be slaves of the superior. But the beauty of the body is seen, whereas the beauty of the soul is not seen. It is clear, then, that some men are by nature free and others slaves, and that for these latter, slavery is both expedient and right. But because the soul cannot be seen, and it is in the soul where you find whether you are by nature a slave or not, it means that the way that slavery is practiced may be unjust, because some who by nature are, are, are free men are nonetheless subjugated <coughs> to slavery. And so therefore, if you cannot guarantee that those who are enslaved are and should be enslaved by virtue of their nature, perhaps it's better not to have slavery at all. That argument has been suggested as a way to try to rescue this discussion from Aristotle. I don't know if that's a compelling argument. I think we're reading into Aristotle something there that may not exist. It's true, I should note, that Aristotle had slaves, and at the end of his life, he freed them. So he may have had some qualms about this institution. But I think trying to make that justification, or trying to make that argument that he's using the natural definition of slavery to contest the conventional definition of slavery is a willful reading. It's an anachronistic reading. It's a 20th, 21st century reading of Aristotle trying to make him something that he is not, which is a progressive modern thinker whose views conform with our own. I think instead we have to take Aristotle at his own word, you have to take him on his own ideas, and instead try to understand why it is that he is focused on slavery, among other things, in this first book. After he talks about slavery, he then talks about something else, which is, what's the next thing he turns his attention to after he finishes up with slaves? What? No? Before that. He calls it the art of acquisition. But we call it what? Making money, right? He turns to the question of making money. And he asks, how do we, how should we understand this act of gathering, of getting wealth, of gathering wealth? Uh, he starts his discussion, I think, at the 1256A. Let us now inquire into property generally and so on. You'll note that one of the conclusions that comes out of this, he says, the art of war is a natural art of acquisition. War is natural, under uh, in, in Aristotle's reading, 1256b. If nature makes nothing incomplete and nothing in vain, the inference must be that she has made all animals for the sake of man. 
And so from one point of view, the art of war is a natural art of acquisition. But the art of acquisition includes hunting, an art which we ought to practice against wild beasts, and against men who, though intended by nature to be governed, will not submit, for such a war is naturally just. Another very inconvenient sentiment for us. War is natural and ought to be practiced both against wild beasts and against men who ought to be governed, but who refuse to be governed, and so therefore they must be forced to submit. Who, though intended by nature to be governed, will not submit for war of such a kind is naturally just. He then goes on and he describes in some detail this idea of how we, of wealth gathering, of wealth getting. And I think one of the key elements that we see in this discussion, you may recall he seems to anticipate economics. He notes that the use of money is merely conventional, that if you have a lot of money and you substitute it with something else, uh, that it wouldn't serve uh, very much. You see that at 1257b. <clears throat> the natural riches and the natural art of wealth getting are a different thing in their true form. They are part of the management of a household. So there's this idea that the art of gathering wealth is a part of the management of the household. And there's an important characteristic here, which is what? What is Aristotle keen to emphasize in the idea of how we gather wealth, how we get wealth? What does he talk about? Do you remember? The idea of limit. He says, if you simply gather wealth in perpetuity, gather wealth unlimitedly, you're not doing a good thing. But there should be a limit to how much you gather. But there is a limit to this thing. He says it at uh, page 24, at 1258a, 15. You have considered the art of wealth getting which is unnecessary and why men want it, and also the necessary arts of wealth getting which we have seen to be different from the other, and to be a natural part of the art of managing a household concerned with the provision of food, not however like the former kind, unlimited, but having a limit. So he's keen in this discussion of how we gather wealth within our household to note that there are these distinctions between the limited kind and the unlimited kind. And you'll recall that he holds out for special sanction, the practice of usury. What is usury? Lending money and interest, right? Banking, basically. Uh, Aristotle, just another person who doesn't like bankers. He says, uh, you'll see it at 1258b, the most hated sort, and with the greatest reason, is usury, which makes a gain out of money. Itself. Money is merely convention, right? And so if you are using a convention to create something further conventional, it is the worst kind. So this idea of acquisition needs to be directed towards good ends. And one of its fundamental features seems to be the idea of limit. We're not going to be able to do too much with that idea right now. But you'll see when we come back to this discussion, we look at what we might call Aristotle's comparative politics, that that sense of limit becomes important to how he then understands the gestation, or sorry, the, uh, the, emer uh, the organization of the state. Let's take a look at the third and final element of the household management that Aristotle considers here in Book One. We've seen his discussion of slavery, in which he argues then that the slave is a naturally constituted person, characterized by their lack of logos, their inability to reason, but only to apprehend reason. We see then in this context of wealth getting that is a natural function of the household management, the act of getting wealth, but that it must be practiced in a good way, not a bad way, characterized by the sense of limit. And then finally, we have the remaining part of the household, which is the rule of a man over his wife and his children. And here he has these two distinctions. We can turn to what we might call Aristotle's anti-feminism in which he urges women to be silent. Ladies, I'm sure you all took great note of that. Silence is a woman's glory, he quotes uh, approvingly, but saying silence is a woman's glory. What is Aristotle's view of the woman in the household, other than that she should be silent? Slave. Is she a slave? No. Yeah. No, she's not a slave, so she's not that bad. Pretty much. She, is she pretty much a slave? Really? Do we think that Aristotle's view of women in the household is that of a slave? She lacks logos. Does she, does she lack logos? 
What she lacks is what he calls authority. If you turn back to where we just saw that, uh, chapter, or that description of the slaves, 1260a, lines uh, 10 going forward. The slave, he says, has no deliberative faculty at all. Slave can't think. A woman has it, but it is without authority. She cannot direct it to some kind of authoritative end. So women do have logos. It's just the way in which it can be practiced is characterized by an absence of authority. And the child has, has this reasoning, but it is immature. So it must necessarily be supposed to be with the excellence of character also. So the woman has all this, which means then that the characteristic of rule that exists within the household between, a, say, a master and a slave and a husband and his wife is different because this sort of natural condition is different. And so he comes to this point and he describes, and there's an inconsistency here that we are, I think, not going to be able to reconcile. He describes a relationship, master and slave, as a royal or as a uh, monarchical relationship, as if a, a, a subject to his king. But he describes a relationship between a wife, or a husband and his wife, as characterized by, does anyone remember what kind of rule it is? Constitutional rule. It is an example of a constitutional rule. So that's a fundamental difference between the monarchical rule, or the regal authority that the master has over the slave, and the constitutional authority that a husband has over his wife. What is the difference between royal or regal authority and constitutional authority? Regal authority, you simply command. You tell people what to do. Is that the case in their constitutional authority? No. What is a constitution? A set of rules, right? It's a code of conduct that's been established. And so the, the relationship then between a husband and a wife corresponds to this idea of a set of rules that govern behavior. Where is the authority then in that relationship? The authority is in the kind of constitutional nature itself. The woman who lacks authority in her logos then has the authority of the constitution, as it were, this constitutional relationship, or constitutional guide, I should say, that's in the relationship by which she can then direct or use her reason. And then finally for children, because they're immature, he says that the relationship of a father or the relationship of a, of, of a father to his children is one of what he calls love and respect due to age. That's where that sense comes from. He also interestingly calls that a regal or a royal or a monarchical relationship, but it seems clear that the relationship governing a father and his children, a master and his slave, and a, they are different. They're not the same kind of relationship even though he uses the same word. To sum up, why is it that Aristotle spends this first book examining these different elements of the household. Why does, what's the purpose of this foray into the minutiae of the household? Because um, that's, uh, that uh, status quo, let's call it, um, is what then provides the, the good that an individual is, uh, seeks for. To have slaves? <coughs> Sorry? To have slaves? Yeah, I mean, is now that you've gone through this lecture, you're Armed with a good life, you're going to go out and try and enslave some people. Say, listen, just be reading a little Aristotle, map with a little of the I domain of goodness. No, I don't enslave you. But it's not my fault. Well, Aristotle well, says like, I have to. Um, just like uh, Plato says in the Republic, that uh, it is that um, uh, the acceptance of the of his ideal Republic and everyone uh, doing their task appropriately that becomes just. That's true. That you could say that. But why start with the household? I think that's the question: is what's going on there? Yes. Because then, uh, I told you, they're favorite left side of the room. They won the earlier contest, and so now they get all the they get the privilege of speaking. Because he then criticizes the Plato's view of the household, and he's just works. setting up his criticism of Plato. Yeah, and he's he first. Needs I think to there's more to it than that. I think first there's more to it than that. Define himself, what he thinks, before he can criticize Plato's. Okay. Well, he says that men are just by nature and he's observing, so it's easier to start off with the household than just like go and kind of tear apart the whole state from which the husband starts more and he kind of builds up with that. How does, when, remember when Socrates investigates this notion of justice, Glaucon and Adiamantus put forth this provocative notion of justice as conventional. What does Socrates say we need to do? He says we need to start with 
that which is big, that which is written in great letters, and use that to then decipher that which is written in small letters. What is Aristotle, in effect, doing here? The reverse. We start with the small, we start with the component, and from there we'll move out into what we see around us in the larger iteration. What is it that makes up a state? What is its material cause? It is the households that exist within the state. And so if we can find something about the nature of authority, the nature of rule that exists within the household, it will then enable us to be able to draw from that some argument about the nature of rule that we might find in the state, because it is then tethered by, and the word that Aristotle uses over and over again is, our nature. It is who we are by our very <coughs> nature. And so when we look at those relationships of rule in the family, husband to wife, husband to children, master to slave, in each one, he's very, he's very keen to make sure that it's grounded in the understanding of what constitutes the natural relationship, the natural state of rule. And it seems to conclude, and we'll pick up with this discussion tomorrow, it seems to conclude with the idea that there are some who naturally shall rule, and there are others who naturally shall be ruled. And that it seems then to be a fundamental condition of the state that we accept that there, there, there is this basic division between those who shall rule and those who shall be ruled. I'll leave it there. I'll take your question after class, but I'll leave it there. Or do you have a comment to make? Yeah, why don't you say that, isn't, that because he sees the state like a household, describes the relationships because from class to class like uh, the relationship in a household. From master to slave. That's right. You draw, what, what, you, what you can observe in the household naturally then to be observed in this state. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow, uh, and we'll pick up our discussion. Remember, you're reading responses over here today at 11.59. If you're a few minutes late, there may be a small window, but I'm not going to tell you how long it is so that you can't get in by 11.59. Yes. If you didn't sign in, come here and I'll sign you in.